Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Happy Tuesday. Happy Wednesday. Apologies. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we have such an exciting lineup for you all today. I'm going to go ahead and get us kicked off. Um, and as folks get in and get settled, every, there's something for everyone here. And so um, hopefully they won't miss too much. All right. Um, on behalf of the REL West at West Ed, I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Welcome to the second webinar of a two-part webinar series on creating culturally affirming spaces. My name is Erin Browder and I work as a senior program associate at West Ed. I'm happy to be here as a facilitator and content lead on this series. And I'm joined by my Rail West colleagues who will shortly introduce themselves. During the first session, which is posted on Facebook that we can link for folks who may not have caught that, we focused on what culturally affirming spaces look like in schools and classrooms. Today, we will talk about systems level approaches on the district level and or the school level, ways that we can cultivate culturally affirming uh, spaces and conditions for success. We know for those of us in this work, we know that this is not the, the work of one person, one school or one leader. No matter what their extraordinary capabilities and superpowers are as they relate to culturally responsive practices, this is a collective, a shared effort that has both individual and collective responsibilities. Today's webinar will be structured into two parts. One, where our REL, our REL West staff will situate research and context. And then we will invite our panelists to share more about their experiences, their expertise, and their skills in the field. We have an incredible panel of recognized leaders, practitioners, and researchers who are experts in their craft and individually and collectively bring unique perspectives to this work about how we can build and contribute to positive systems change that honor and value the diversity of our students. There are a couple things to note as we get started. One, is that we situate this idea, this notion of culturally affirming spaces as a voice of a larger conversation around culturally responsive and sustaining education. This conversation includes uh, concepts like racial equity, equitable systems, cultural competence, and et cetera. While these terms do not have the same definitions, nor should they be conflated, they work in relationship with each other and help us build a more full and vivid picture of what is needed to support the social and emotional and academic well being of the students we serve so that they can do more than just survive, to quote Bettina Love. The lens of culturally affirming spaces helps us envision an outcome or a setting of where we see culturally, linguistically, ethnically, and racially diverse students and staff feel seen and valued. Um, to note, the chat will remain open throughout our webinar, and we'd like for you to use it as an opportunity to interact with other audience members. Um, we are going to ask that you refrain from messaging individuals on the panel or facilitators and that you do not share personal information. During our part two, we will ask for questions um, that we can pose to our panelists, but we already have a set of questions. Um, so we ask for your flexibility. And as we get started, let's set an intention for our time here. Whether you're here to learn something new, be in community with like minds, you're just curious, or you're making connections with something you're already doing, I invite you to take a deep breath and sit with that intention as we get started. And a bit about the Regional Educational Laboratory West or REL West. We are the sponsor of today's webinar. There's um, 10 regional labs across the country, and our goal is to promote the use of data and research evidence to inform policy and practice. We work with educators and policymakers to support evidence-based, equitable education systems. And our presenter team today, we have the same team of um, presenters from our first webinar to share the research background on culturally affirming school systems. That team includes Erin Browder, whom you've met, David Lopez, 
Raleen Rosario. Um, they are all part of the talent development and diversity team here at West Ed. Members of this team work directly with the SEAs, districts and schools, providing, a professional, providing professional learning, technical assistance, and resources to develop and retain an effective, culturally responsive, and racially and linguistically diverse educator workforce. They also provide technical assistance, evaluation services, and research that increase educators and leaders' use of policies and practices that promote equitable learning outcomes for each student. And now our panelists. In addition to our Rel West and West Ed presenters, we're really excited to have with us five panelists from across the country with deep knowledge and diverse experiences in supporting and leading culturally, racially, socially, and linguistically just education systems. Um, on our panel, we have Dr. Ayana Allen Handy, Dr. Ayana Cooper, who was with us uh, for the first webinar as well, Dr. Rosa Perez Isaiah, Jabari Lyles, and Reed Swear. They will each get a chance to tell a bit more about their work and who they are when we move to the panel discussion. Um, but I'll share a bit here to whet your appetite. They all started their careers in the classroom um, and they continue to teach in one way or another today. They are passionate advocates for systems change, for youth, for social justice, um, and for creating culturally affirming systems, schools, and classrooms. These are nationally known professionals who get their message out in a multitude of ways. They author books and articles, they host podcasts, they write blogs, um, they do TED Talks, they provide professional learning, and they gift us with their knowledge and experience in events like this. We're grateful that they're here today and we'll hear much more about them, <clears throat> about them and from them in the second half of the webinar. Welcome everyone. My name is Raulin Rosario from West Ed. I'm very excited to be with this community once again. For today's webinar, our objectives remain the same. Uh, we're gonna deepen our understanding of culturally affirming school and classroom cultures and climates and how they shape student and staff outcomes. We're gonna explore systemic approaches for embedding culturally affirming spaces and practices at the school and district level. And lastly, we're gonna learn about promising leadership practices and adult behaviors that foster culturally affirmative schooling experiences from practitioners in the field. And we're gonna go ahead and start off with the research as Lori mentioned, we're gonna talk about culturally affirming spaces, but this time with a real focus on systems orientation. We'll review session one core concepts, talk about systems culture and barriers, and end with culturally responsive leadership competencies and behaviors. The main event of this webinar, as you all know, will be our panel discussion around creating systems and systemic culture that are culturally affirming for culturally, racially, ethnically, and linguistically diverse students. After the panel, we'll have a chance to do some Q&A with our amazing panelists and then close out. So to start off, we wanted to pose this question, who's on the webinar? We invite you to respond to the following questions. What is your role and how familiar are you with culturally affirming practices at the systems level or in general, just in, at the systems level, at the school level? If you do not see your role, please feel free to type it into the chat. We have some school-based educators here, about 13%. I see some district-based administrators around 20% as well. We have a few people from community-based organizations, about 2%. And we have quite a significant number of researchers or technical assistance providers with 30%. And I see in our chat, we have anywhere from architects to audiologists to New York State Department of Education members to child development consultants. So we have quite the broad range of uh, participants here today. And then our second question, it seems, as you can see in the results, it seems that most of us are just learning and not familiar with culturally affirming practices 
Um, some of us are in between, but that just means that we'll be learning and sharing a lot of information today. Thank you all for participating and please continue to share responses and uh, questions in the chat. Thank you, Raleen. Thank you for setting up the space. Um, so we wanted to make sure at the top of our session, we had a brief recap of some of the core concepts that we discussed in session one. So I'm gonna ask uh, Dell, can you go to the next slide? And I'll share a little bit about how we conceptualize or understood how culture shows up and is expressed inside of our schools. We started with an opening activity that asked folks, in what ways do we see, hear, and feel culture in schools? And as a neat way to, to put you in interaction or engagement with the, the webinar one participants, I captured some of their responses in the chat. So some of the responses we got were the way that, the, how we see culture in schools um, would be the way that people interact with each other, right? The way our students engage, their relationships, the holidays that are celebrated, the colloquialisms that we hear, the language that is spoken, the music that we hear, um, the stories students tell, artwork and so forth, right? And that we were really able to honor an expansive view of culture, right? One that situated race in the center as race in our society is prevalent and salient in the ways that we um, behave, the ways that we understand and see the world, the ways that the world experiences ourselves as well. But it's also inclusive of other rings of culture, such as gender culture and age culture, youth culture and religious culture. And it's really important that we start in this space because oftentimes we see race being conflated with culture. And when we lump the two together, we miss all of the ways that opportunities that we can validate and affirm student culture, and then the ways that we invalidate student culture, right? The ways that we might um, pass a judgment or um, dis, uh, uh, devalue in a sense that it doesn't echo a normative, um, a heteronormative value, um, what we might see in um, the, the dominant culture that is pervasive inside of the schools and the systems. Um, that being said, we also wanted to make sure that we uh, centered back on how we're situating um, and explaining, defining culturally affirming spaces. So culturally affirming spaces, schools and classrooms where adult practices, behaviors and policies thoroughly acknowledge and proactively seek to affirm students' cultural identities and multifaceted cultural assets as integral to students' positive self-concept, academic and social well-being, while working to reduce harm in microaggressions experienced by students and families of color, right? And this is happening in real time. This is uh, an emerging field or body of work that we're starting to hear a lot about. It's a term that we're starting to hear as we think about um, educator diversity and knowing the importance of culturally affirming spaces to retain educators, recruit and retain educators of color. Just curious, I'm, I'm reading through some of your responses. Love the focus on adult practices, the reduction of harm. So what we see in this understanding is that culturally affirming spaces, what they are and what they aren't, right? So they are a space where we're actively, proactively seeking ways of, of affirming and validating our students' cultural identities. And what they aren't is this prevalence of harm and microaggressions that students of color experience um, every day in our classrooms and in our schools. So we hold both of those truths at the same time, knowing that when we're able to um, focus on one, we're still tending to um, the, the unconscious ways that we might um, microaggress our students or, or microaggress each other. So as we are going to venture into this world of beliefs and how beliefs really form the deep structure of how our systems are organized, how we communicate and engage with each other, I also want to introduce what a culturally affirming belief is, right? So we identify these beliefs, but it's about replacing them. Um, so here's one. It is Cultural assets are resources for new learning and meaning making, right? 
So what might it look like if we had practices and policies and structures that really center these cultural assets and help us make new connections with the world, with the people in the world around us? All right, I will walk us through uh, this definition, right? Because just as we explore through the culturally affirming spaces, um, understanding what they are and what they aren't, we also need to have a deeper understanding, a shared understanding of what microaggressions are. This comes from two sources. So microaggressions are brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative messages, slights, and insults towards people with marginalized identities and deniable acts of discrimination on the basis of false or pathological stereotypes about marginalized groups. So that's a really big and complex definition. I'm just gonna pause here. Who defines intentional or unintentional, right? And that really gets to that deniable, the, the part of this definition, the deniable acts of discrimination because the folks that are most um, able to articulate what that experience are are the ones that are also experiencing the microaggression, right? And, and there's an analogy that we hear in the field of, of microaggressions being like paper cuts, right? And so our students moving throughout their day, all the different cuts, and, and the truth is as someone who experiences microaggressions, it, it does not feel like a paper cut, right? It feels, oftentimes it feels worse uh, than a paper cut. Another thing I want to highlight, we will talk about racial microaggressions and microaggressions can occur um, from a number of identities, right? So it's not just centered, it's, it's inclusive of race, but it also includes language. It includes uh, nativism. So you're not from here, like you can't speak on this. It includes gender, it includes religion. Right, so the marginalized identities is pretty pronounced here. All right, and um, in our first webinar, we do break down microaggressions and talk about the different ways that they're experienced, and we invite you to check that out. And so, as we think about, you know, our students and their well-being, their academic, their social emotional well-being, their their positive self-concept, we really need to have a firm understanding and grasp of what is the collective impact of daily microaggressions and culturally harmful experiences. And what you see here are these three main categories, right? This internalized evaluation. So I can't do this. Feeling unaccomplished, I don't do anything well. Low self-esteem, unworthiness. An assaulted sense of self, an unhealthy worldview inability or struggle towards goal setting, a narrowed sense of time, right? An example I gave last time is, you know, we talked to some of our secondary, even our primary students, and they're like, miss, I live for today, right? They can't even hold an idea of, of what life would look like for themselves in, in five, 10 years from now. Increased arousal, a, a basic mistrust of adults and even people, peers their own age internalized voicelessness, not speaking up for themselves, limited demonstration of agency, appeasement, that's people pleasing, limited emotional expressions, right? So we know that there's a number of factors that can, can uh, contribute to these outcomes. And this experience inside of schools can heighten any one of, of ask indicator or category that a student might be experiencing. And that the more we become aware, the more we can work to reduce um, our own uh, agency or excuse me, our own contribution to that experience for students, as well as helping our colleagues in our schools as a whole. Awesome. Thank you. Deb. Next slide. Awesome. So you all are going to get to hear a lot from me in these first um, couple slides, uh, which is awesome. I hope you think that as well. Um, let me pull up my notes here. So now we're transitioning, we're moving into our systems focus. And when it comes to systems change, 
I think all of us are aware of a number of approaches and well-documented practices that can help us build this magical system that we know that can exist. If only it were that simple. If only it were that simple. We have all the tools, the resources, the strategy, the blueprints, and yet we're further away than what we started with. I'd like us all to envision the black box of systems change, right? That all the neat and organized inputs go in. And when we look at the outputs, we see that that's not really what we signed up for. Again, further from the outcome than maybe when we first started, feel the feeling that things are in even more of a disarray. And that's our experience inside of the system. But when we pause and think about who suffers most, we think about our students and our families. When our systems are consciously or unconsciously organized around trauma, biased perspectives about students and, and deficit frames about what students and families can do or have unequal shares of power, so who we listen to, who's directing the changes and in the initiatives of that district, we start to see systemic harm in daily interactions and we see it in the data. Additionally, when we dispatch all of our resources and energy into the wrong problem, we find ourselves going in circles and caught in energy traps. Today, we are gonna spend some time in this black box. For the next few minutes, we are going to name and surface some of the complexity of systems change work acknowledge the deep structures of systems and how it pertains to creating culturally affirming spaces and building a culture of culturally responsive and sustaining practices. During our panel discussion, we will hear examples and strategies of ways that our panelists have seen or implemented system level changes, the lessons they've learned, the transformative practice they've, practices that they've either been involved in or that they've witnessed, all that work towards developing welcoming and meaningful schooling experiences for our racially, linguistically, and culturally diverse students. That was a lot of talking. Now it's time to hear from you. Um, so our question for you all is, in what ways do we experience systems and school culture? All right, so I see lots of things in here, great. Faculty hiring, grading and assessment, family engagement, rules and procedures, behavior management systems, right? What's accept the norming of what's acceptable behaviors and what are unacceptable behaviors, a sense of belonging, what is valued and taught and tested, the ways we have students get to school, right? How they travel to classrooms, the Pledge of Allegiance, pedagogy, awesome, thank you. Dale, can you move to the next slide? So in anticipation of a lot of the responses you have here, as well as some we heard in session one, I pre-populated a list that really echoes a lot of what we're seeing in the chat. So some of the ways that we experience systems culture, the language that's used to describe students and families, acceptable and unacceptable behaviors, the policies that guide and structure our systems, funding and resource allocation, professional development, what is supervised and prioritized, Right, so I think we're all on the same, on a similar page in terms of how we experience um, culture in our, inside of our schools and systems. So as we move more in, inside of this conversation, I really want to pull our focus around students. And what we see here are these four domains um, provided by the Bellet framework, which is the building equitable learning environments for students. And they have categorized kind of these four main domains that center students and that we see inside of our districts and inside of our schools that have a lot of overlap as well in terms of like staffing and resources. So there's teaching and learning, the school culture and school-wide policies, district and state policies, and family and community partnerships, right? This is the context in which we are operating. So all of those um, noticings and ways that we experience culture that we just named live inside of, of these domains that we see here. And they're all opportunities as we think about what needs to be shifted, changed, what needs to be stopped, started, and continued um, in terms of supporting culturally affirming spaces for our students. So we wanna invite you all to consider how you 
both as an individual, but also collectively uh, steward it and uphold systemic culture in your context. And so if you think back to the four domains that we shared, where does your role sit in that, in those four domains, teaching and learning, district and school policies, school policies, family and community partnerships? And in that context, how do you as an individual steward the systemic culture that you named? Are you grading students? Are you conducting and facilitating professional learning? And then as a group with other folks that you're working with, that you're in community with as a grade level team, in what ways are you collectively stewarding systemic culture in your context? All right, so as David has transitioned us to think about what the role is of beliefs in our work. So as we're stewarding, you know, the systemic culture um, based on our individual roles inside of a system and the ways that we enga engage with other folks, what are some of those beliefs that underlie our actions and behaviors? And so um, leaning into the work of Dr. Edward Fergus, we categorize our bias-based beliefs in these three chunks, right? These three buckets. Um, from color evasiveness, to deficit thinking, to poverty disciplining belief. And I'm actually going to ask Raleen to read for us the definition of color evasiveness. And I'll just call in different folks to read to kind of break up the voices here. Awesome. So the first bias-based belief is color evasiveness, as Aaron just mentioned. Here we see that the dominant racial ideology is based on color evasiveness, right? Where many of us have been conditioned to think that race does not play a factor in people's experiences or social identities are often ignored, right? So when I hear, oh, well, race is irrelevant, you're just an individual, this creates a tension for me, right? Although this person didn't create racism, the failure to see race obscures racism and therefore perpetuates it. And next we have our def deficit thinking. And I wanna, I wanna say that this is probably one of the more um, dominant bias-based beliefs that a lot of us are aware of that we might hear in other um, settings or we might hear folks that we work with um, who are conveying these types of beliefs. Um, and we might find ourselves kind of unconsciously falling into um, patterns where we're perpetuating deficit thinking. Um, so the description here provided by uh, Dr. Richard Valencia is an ideology used within all levels of educational systems to explain academic performance as a result of deficiencies within an individual and group. It discounts the presence of systemic inequalities as the result of race-based processes, practices, and policies. The foundation of deficit thinking is genetic pathology and culture of poverty. So even as I read that, you're, you might be thinking, oh, never me, right? Like that can't be me. But one thing that we'll get into is thinking about how we all adopt the behaviors and are conditioned inside of our systems. Even if we come in thinking something different, it is really easy to fall into patterns of bias-based beliefs and language that is frequently used to describe the abilities and the identities of our students and their families. And underneath each, we have examples um, of each of the, the different types. So you have students of color from disadvantaged homes just seem to show a lack of initiative. The values and beliefs shared by those in disadvantaged neighborhoods tend to go against school values and beliefs about what makes up a good education. And lastly, poverty disciplining belief. Raleen, can I pass to you? Yes, uh, so poverty disciplining summed up means that poverty prevents people's success in life. This is the theory here. And as society, we focus on changing the behaviors and the thinking of individuals from low-income backgrounds and telling them, well, you have to act a certain way or you have to be a certain way in, in order to be successful. And so we see this take shape in many forms, right? From policies that and I saw some of this in the chat that ban certain hairstyles in schools, right? Um, and although race may not always be the focus of poverty disciplining, they're often conflated. And another piece here of poverty disciplining really states that 
poverty causes issues with development in children. And this is just not the case. So one thing that we really want to drive home is a saying we hear a lot in systems change work, and that is every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. So when we look at the data and we see the inequities between the different student groups, we look at disaggregated data, we need to ask ourselves, right, what are the practices that are contributing to this? And beneath the surface, what are the beliefs and the policies that are perpetuating, right? Kind of almost greasing the will to help us get to those um, outcomes, however much we don't want them or desire them. Another notion, and this is actually a popular phrase uh, within improvement science and implementation science. And one thing I just want to kind of put an asterisk here is that you know what we put in, we get out as well. So when we engage in different processes that are constructed to help us improve and get better, if we don't uh, address the beliefs and some of the deeper structures that are um, within us as individuals and within the system as a whole, we can find ourselves still perpetuating that harm using a tool from improvement science or using a tool from implementation science or and, and other strategies, right? Not to single those out. So bias in is bias out. So we have to name what those are and actively work to replace those uh, bias-based beliefs. And so this is a really a description of what we've already started to frame um, for you all, right? We're all super familiar with iceberg diagrams. And here we see at the base, right? The stronghold, the foundation are those mental models. The assumptions, beliefs, and values that people hold about the system, within the system, about the communities we serve? What beliefs keep that system in place? Moving up to the policies, right? How do we communicate those policies? How do we hold our systems together? What is defining the structures, the ways that we engage? What is acceptable language and behaviors inside of our systems? We see that in our policies. Those inform our procedures, how we get work done. And then the practices are at the surface. So a lot of times, and we'll talk about this uh, quickly on the common barrier, um, when we're talking about common systems barriers, we come up with strategic or structural changes, um, goals and initiatives, but oftentimes we're not going deep enough to unearth what are some of the beliefs that are keeping these alive. Awesome. Next slide, please. So as we consider some of the barriers, if we don't go deep, we'll find ourselves running into these, right? And, and a lot of these are common. These are things that we see in our work supporting districts, supporting state agencies. There's a culture of compliance, right? You just got to get it done. Put your head down. We're all on autopilot. Race neutral or color evasive approaches. How can we do work towards equity if we aren't looking at disaggregated data? What truths are we not telling to ourselves? Over-reliance on structural or strategic changes and avoiding the mindset and belief work, right? And this is at all system levels, right? You might have senior leaders come in or, or look to us and, and say, hey, I need you to train you know, the folks on the ground. It's a top-down, down-up approach, right? Ground-up approach misaligned and problematic policies. We'll talk about that shortly. But a lot of times we see this microaggression, systemic harm, structural racism that lives inside of the policies that are governing the behaviors and the practices of the adults in our systems. Fragmented problem solving, siloed or departments working in isolation. Not regularly looking again at disaggregated data. I cannot stress that enough. Um, a lot of times folks are trying so busy to uh, trying to solve the wrong problem. They haven't even determined what the right problem is or conducted a root cause analysis. And failing to have a plan to acknowledge blind spots and, and obstacles that are likely to occur, right? We are not doing this work in a vacuum. We even here today, our larger community, a network of practitioners and educators who are engaged how are we leveraging our resources and supports and tools to help us row in the same direction? 
Next slide, please. So I want us to hold something in mind because as I alluded to on this last slide, if we stop at these barriers and these walls and we don't do the work necessary to move through them, we continue to uh, do what this quote situates for us here and I'll read it for everyone. Districts and schools serve as conduits of racial microaggressions for they often transmit social cultural messages which can perpetuate students' feelings of inferiority. And when internalized at the level of the unconscious can greatly affect students' well-being. So shifting back to that early slide that talks about what are the, might the, the collective or accumulative experience for our students who are experiencing daily microaggressions. We see that policies and, and districts and schools can actually be the, the vehicle that transmits these messages of inferiority. And I want to also highlight here, while this says racial microaggressions, I wanna open that up a bit, right? Because that also includes um, gender microaggressions and um, language and different ways that we experience um, the dominant culture and the disinvalidation of the inherent culture that our students are bringing in. Hodgkins and other researchers have framed how K-12 student microaggressive experiences um, align with structural racism, right? That it can both be experienced on a structural level and an interpersonal level. So in our first webinar, we talked about that interpersonal experience. But here, as we think about the policies that govern and shape our systems, how do they materialize the microaggressions and the, and the stereotypes that we have of the students and the families that we serve? Thinking about our policies, we, we know a lot about zero tolerance and discipline policies and the disproportionate impact they have for students. Dress codes, when someone mentioned uh, hairstyles, the Crown Act. Right, special education referrals, teacher evaluation processes, curriculum and instructional materials. Right, these are all places as we're conceptualizing micro, um, excuse me, culturally affirming spaces. Again, holding what they are and what they aren't. We have to address how these, um, how racism and microaggressions live inside of our policies. And we're tasked with doing the work of what are the beliefs beneath that, right? Going beneath the surface to reframe and transform what those policies um, look like, what they sound like and how they impact our students. I'm gonna pause there. There's been a lot of talking. We'd love to hear some of the ahas that folks might be having um, who are watching, different things that are resonating with them. How does this, this quote land for you? All right, so we're going to move on and, and start to move our conversation from this complexity towards the solutions, right? And hearing from and getting ready to hear from our panelists. Thanks, Aaron. And so as Aaron said, how do we begin to address these systemic barriers so that we can ultimately create culturally affirming environments and spaces for our students and families? Well, the research shows us that one way is through cultivating and strengthening culturally responsive leadership. In his research, Muhammad Khalifa offers powerful examples that show how cultural responsiveness is a necessary component of effective school lead leadership. And that if cultural responsiveness is to be present and sustainable in our schools, then it has to be consistently promoted by a school leader or a, a district leader, right? And as you can see in this graphic, Dr. Khalifa lays out a four set of unique le leadership behaviors that characterize culturally responsive leadership. The first is developing culturally responsive teachers. Leaders are the central driving fo force oftentimes in instructional leadership or in curriculum development. And they are also held accountable for the growth and efficacy of their teachers. And as such, they're positioned to help teachers improve their practice by building teacher capacity, equity mindsets to really address these bias-based beliefs through professional development opportunities, and even modeling what culturally affirming behaviors are in their own schools. 
The next piece here is critically reflecting on one's culturally affirming leadership. Building leaders must understand their own multiple identities before they can help build culturally responsiveness in their teachers, in their school, with the other staff. And these leaders must commit to this continuous learning and self-reflection while at the same time seeking the voices of students and teachers to really understand how culture is being validated or not throughout their school. The next component is promoting culturally responsive and inclusive school environments, right? Leaders should establish shared language for their school, for their district, a vision for what culturally affirming practices look like, right? We've talked a lot about this in our webinars. Leaders must be clear, what does this look like? What does this not look like? Leaders must challenge exclusionary policies, teachers and behaviors while affirming changes that center and respect the identities of our culturally, linguistically and racially diverse students. And the last piece that Dr. Khalifa really emphasizes for culturally responsive leadership is to engage students, parents and indigenous contexts. Aside from building one's own cultural proficiency and you know, encouraging teachers to adopt and use these practices, leaders must include parents and communities in their leadership activities, right? Community-based histories and perceptions must be at the center of any efforts to overcome systemic barriers. And so leaders have to find ways to engage communities, to build relationships without perpetuating or reinforcing these bias-based beliefs, these deficit-based policies, and ultimately reproducing oppression in our schools. And so although his research really focuses on school building principles, it is important to note that this is not the job of just one person or one group or one school, right? As Aaron said earlier, it's about how do we collectively as a system row in the same direction? How do we collectively as educators incorporate what we've learned and push a little bit, right? And so these are some high level aspects of what Dr. Khalifa offers and the, his full article and framework offer a bit more comprehensive understanding of the behaviors and competencies that culturally responsive leaders should possess. And I know that our panelists will also expand on some of these notions. So where do we start, right? How do we begin to disrupt inequities? How do we build culturally affirming environments? On this slide, we would just wanna offer multiple starting points, recognizing that you know, some of these, as our team on the talent development and diversity at West said, we have experience, so we want to highlight a few of these, but also our panelists will highlight these when they speak. And again, these are not meant to be done alone, right? And again, these are not meant to be specifically done in this particular order. But one starting point could be building a task force, right? A team that initiates this work that is really intentional about building a team with diverse backgrounds of not just where people come from, but their roles. Analyzing this aggregated data, looking for places to start, right? When we start analyzing and disaggregating our data, we can really think about root causes and analyzing them to conduct a systemic equity review, right? To really reflect on what the community needs and what is not being given. Another starting point could be to utilize self-assessment tools to really calibrate where you are as a team and where you are on your uh, culturally responsive journey and really help you identify areas for improvement. I think an important starting point as well could be really taking the time to interview those most affected and marginalized. This could be engaging students in youth participatory action research to learn from the lived experiences of the students. Um, youth participatory action research really involves the young people themselves gathering information about pressing issues in their school or in their community and advocating for those solutions. And I think lastly, engaging really regularly with critical questions that help us to refocus and recenter the work at hand. And some of these can be found in work done from Garmston and Wellman 2016. And there are three simple questions. Who are we? Why are we doing this? And why are we doing this this way? 
And again, we offer these as starting points to give you all an idea of the types of actions that we can take as collective educators to create truly culturally affirming, affirming spaces. Our amazing panelists will talk about one or more of these with more specificity, and I'm sure they'll give you some personal examples of where they may have started. So that was a tremendous amount of information, thought-provoking um, information about culturally affirming systems, how they show up in schools and districts, uh, the barriers to implementation, and some of the starting places for us. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, before we move to the panel discussion, let's take a second to kind of catch our breath and to think, <clears throat> excuse me, to reflect back and just choose that one, one piece of information, that tidbit that you heard um, that really resonated with you. Um, and make a few notes on that before we move forward. Um, maybe it's something big like the four categories from the ballet framework or something from the Khalifa uh, piece. Maybe it's just one small tidbit um, that you're gonna take with you, bias in, bias out. Um, so pick something, consider that insight, reflect on how it, it sits within that iceberg system diagram. Is it part of the beliefs, the policies, the procedures or practices in, in your organization? Um, we are gonna jump right into creating systems a conversation around creating systems that are culturally affirming for racially, ethnically, linguistically, and gender diverse students. Um, our next slide, please. Our panelists today, as I mentioned earlier, are Dr. Ayana Allen Handy, Dr. Ayana Cooper, Dr. Rosa Perez Isaiah, Jabari Lyles, and Reed Swear. Um, we'll be posting some links in the chat to their work and um, other resources. You can also pose your questions uh, to the panelists in the chat. We will get as, to as many as we can, um, but we're prior, again, we're prioritizing those that are of broadest interest to our participants. Erin and David will serve as the facilitation of the facilitators for the discussion. Uh, so a huge thanks to our panelists. We're so grateful you're here to share your insights and experience with us. And we'll start with a personal introduction. Each one will take a turn for a few minutes to introduce themselves and to answer our first question, which is, why is this work important to you? Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Ellen Handy to introduce herself. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be here and sharing this space with you this afternoon. My name is Ayana Allen Handy. Um, I am a teacher, I am a scholar, I'm a researcher, um, and I'm really, really excited to be in this space. Um, this work for me is my life's work, um, not only as a parent, but also as a scholar. Um, I have dedicated the last 20 years as an urban education teacher in Houston for, for many years a counselor, and now as a professor at Drexel University in Philadelphia. And for me, the work is personal um, because I grew up in Philly. And so I'm able to really be back in the space that made me and was so critical to my own development um, and to really live out what I call my family legacy. Um, so it's really great to be here and I'm excited for our discussion today. Hi, I'm Ayana too. You have Ayana Squid on this call. Uh, I'm Ayana Cooper. I am an educator and civil rights activist, um, a, a teacher at heart, of course, a researcher. Um, I'm also the author of And Justice for Ls and also the co-editor of Black Immigrants in the United States, Essays on the Politics of Race, Language, and Voice. And this work too is uh, very um, near and dear to my heart. And for me, it began very early because uh, at five years old, I was assigned the role of Rosa Parks in the school play. And so I share that because at a very young age, I knew that was an important role. Um, I knew that my, that was, my parents were very proud of. I had the role of Rosa Parks. I, we had to practice different scenes, I understood injustice and, and what it meant to treat certain people differently. So I say that because I want to remind um, all of you of how important it is for us to think about the roles that we assign our students in our classrooms and how that can have a lasting impact on their lives. 
Um, and so I work alongside school leaders and support their capacity to um, assure better outcomes for students who are identified as English learner or multilingual learner. And I um, just am looking forward to continuing this conversation this afternoon, this morning. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm simply delighted to be here with you today. Um, I am Dr. Rosa Perez Isaiah, currently Director of Elementary Equity and Access in the Norwalk La Mirada School District in beautiful California, Los Angeles. Uh, recent author of Beyond Conversations About Race. I am a speaker, um, presenter, uh, advocate for, for voices who, who are often um, silenced. Um, and I do this work for really for the younger version of me, uh, the young immigrant, uh, multilingual learner, uh, child in poverty, uh, trauma impacted, first generation, first gen, and for the many, many students out there who, who are like that. Uh, so the work is personal for me, very important. Thank you. Thank you, gracias. And next we have Jabari Lyles. Hey there, uh, good afternoon folks, or good morning to some of you. My name is Jabari Lyles, my pronouns are he and him coming to you live from Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I've been a champion for LGBTQ rights and inclusion in Baltimore and throughout Maryland for over half of my life. Um, I grew up as a Black queer student in the suburbs of Baltimore, and that was a place where conversations about race and class and gender uh, just were not being had. Um, my teachers were not prepared to have those conversations. System leaders were not. Uh, those conversations were tough within my family. Uh, so I got involved with LGBT inclusion in schools from a very young age, uh, became an elementary, middle, and high school teacher in Baltimore City, a nonprofit leader and community organizer, um, and eventually became Baltimore's first ever director of LGBTQ affairs for the office of the mayor, where I advised um, Baltimore's uh, three most previous mayoral administrations on all the things they have to do uh, for, for gender and sexual inclusion and justice. Um, today, I'm an independent consultant doing LGBT inclusion and training for K through 12 schools, as well as nonprofits or businesses or really anyone who will listen to me talk. Um, and so LGBTQ rights, uh, it's super important to me. Uh, it is the, the life that I live, the air that I breathe, um, particularly for our young people in schools. Um, so I'm so excited to share my insight with you today. Thank you, Jabari. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Reed Swear. Hello, everyone. Um, good to be here. My name is Reed Swear, he, him, his. I'm a Associate Director of Training and Development at uh, NYU Metropolitan Center for the Research on Equity and Transformation of Schools. I think I got that right. I always have to really think about that, and it's been year four over there. Um, but I'm at heart uh, an elementary teacher and administrator I come from a line of uh, teachers and social workers out of Michigan um, and currently reside in Brooklyn, New York. Um, my work and, and, and kind of dedication to this work comes from kind of a everyday and ongoing struggle to, to kind of reckon with, with, you know, the American context, white supremacist delusion, my own power and privilege, um, and my impact that I have on, on the spaces that I navigate and engage with. Um, so, so this work is, is, is critical in how I step in every day. Um, I appreciate being here, excited to, to talk through um, what, what was already presented to us. And I love it when I can um, have multiple pages of notes already going into the panel. So thank you all for, for already sharing so much. Awesome. Thank you, Reed. Um, so excited to get this conversation started and we can actually lower the slides. And so we can just see our panelists' faces as they engage in conversation. We have so much to talk about um, with such a short period of time. So what we've done uh, behind the scenes is kind of assigned questions, um, but we definitely welcome folks to uh, on our panel to jump in and um, you know piggyback and add you know one to the different things that they hear from their colleagues. 
Um, so as Reed alluded to, we've talked about a lot of things um, so far in our presentation, um, but we do want to make sure that we spotlight you know, some of the bright spots that we see in the field, some of the examples of leadership and system level beliefs and behaviors that foster culturally affirming practices. So this first question is gonna be a twofer. Um, and that is that you share an example of um, either a leadership practice or a system level belief or behavior that you have seen personally or that you facilitated that fostered a culturally affirming practice. And if you have connections um, or reflections to the information you heard in the first section, we'd love for you to uh, include or make those connections as well. And we're going to get started with Dr. Perez Isaiah. Okay, first of all, I have to say I almost wore polka dots today. And, and I think we would have all been the three of us, Erin, um, Dr. Ayana, Alan Handy. Um, thank you so much, great question. Uh, gosh, where do we begin with this? Um, having people of color in our organizations um, does not create a culturally affirming school or organization. And I think um, when, when people begin in this journey, in this work, uh, sometimes, you know, that's the perception. We were very diverse. Of, of course, we have uh, culturally affirming um, spaces. Uh, but, but the the real deal here is that um, you have to be intentional. You cannot make assumptions and you have to be intentional about this work. Uh, one thing that we engaged in last year as we um, navigated and navigate, continue to navigate the pandemic is a focus on the well being of our community and that social emotional learning piece as a lever for equity. And so we embrace the work around social emotional learning, um, developed a three year plan, and, and part of that plan began with self. And as we engage our, our community and our stakeholders, our staff and students in this work and our families, we know that it begins with, with self and what are our beliefs about our students? What are our beliefs and biases? Um, and how do those beliefs translate into behaviors which then have an impact on whether we are creating those culturally uh, affirming uh, spaces in our schools. So an example is that work and that work of self and addressing um, what the needs are of our diverse community. Thank you, Dr. Perez. And uh, Reed. Thank you. And, and just um, that, how much that resonates with you know, starting with self. And I appreciate that theme that we continue to kind of engage. Um, I, I, the, the piece that I'm, I, I wanna lean on, right, is this, I think Raleen talked about leader, leaders establishing vision, right? And Dr. Muhammad Khalifa's work around cultural responsive leadership so much of my work, um, I spend time talking to district superintendents, right? So whether it's post-training, pre-training, during training, debriefs in between, um, processing, uh, a lot of which is with um, white leaders that, that I'm processing their defensiveness and fragility. Uh, so I, I think in engaging superintendents and districts and then thinking about, you know, as, as I'm trying to transform this into a, a positive, right, what, what I've seen <laughs> as a success, um, the leaders that, that lean in, right, that are saying this is not an initiative, we're not going to throw this in the initiative fatigue bucket, but we are going to say this is, um, this is a foundational approach, cultural responsive sustaining education is not an add-on. Um, everything else fits into that plate, right? So I think um, one, one key piece I have this week that I was excited about, one of our partnering districts actually that David Lopez, uh, part of the West Ed team kind of ushered in some of this push in his prior role here at Metro um, was, was designated a top five institution to work at in, in, in regards to their DEI and inclusion work. Um, and a teacher in that district, we were going through a district self-assessment that our, our, our team developed that we'll share the link of. Um, and a teacher in that district, we were ranking, where are you in your cultural responsiveness? 
And they gave a lot of, it's a zero to two. They gave a lot of zeros around specific indicators, right? Um, that they're still struggling with, with. But the two lived with the district knows that this is of critical importance. And the superintendent knows that this is critical importance. So foundationally, if we can start there and we don't have to continue to have this back and forth with how do I engage this? Do I engage it? Um, my own defensiveness and fragility based on the identities that we hold, right? Um, that, that for me was, that was a win and thinking about how do we keep building there. Thank you, Reed. And passing the mic to Dr. Cooper. Thank you. So I just like to first start and acknowledge the linguistic diversity uh, of, of everyone who's logged on today. Would you mind putting the languages that you speak in the chat? I just like to do that. Let's see who's the first one. Thank you. All right, Arabic, Spanish, American Sign Language. Wonderful, Spanglish, Korean. Look at that. Yeah, I like to do that waterfall of languages. So again, I you know really frame my work around building capacity to better support English learners, multilingual learners in K to 12 settings. And so as you can see from the language waterfall in the chat, I just wanna read off the top six languages. Uh, Spanish, number two, Arabic, Chinese, Vietnamese, Somali, and number six is Haitian Creole. And so part of creating those culturally affirming spaces it also means to include language and, and how, how is that done as part of our school communities. Uh, my four languages are English, uh, Northern because I'm from Boston and it comes out when I go home, uh, Southern because I've made Atlanta my home for over 20 years and of course Ebonics, I can code switch if you need me to. So thank you for, thank you for engaging in that, um, but I list those languages for several reasons because again, I saw earlier in the conversation, it, you can't acknowledge or advocate or affirm groups of students and families if you don't know that they're there. And oftentimes with our language, we say all students, all learners, everyone, sometimes it can water, water down, right? And we, we lose sight of who really, who are the people who are making up these school communities. So I think it's important to, make sure that the language is inclusive, but also our practices are. So I always like to start with some data around uh, linguistic diversity. And so just on a, um, a, a small example of that would be for school leaders to look at language data that uh, is part of their school communities and districts, district leaders as well. And then you know also on a larger scale, looking at um, trends and perhaps the schools and districts may look vastly different than they did 10 to 15 years ago, but that's also what helps to continue to develop our communities, right? Like we can't do the same old thing the same old way and expect different results. So how are our learning communities changing and how are we being proactive about it? Notice I didn't say reactive, but proactive. And I'll, I'll kind of stop right there. I'm gonna pass the mic. <laughs> To Jabari, let's pass it to Jabari. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I think unfortunately in, in my world of LGBTQ inclusion in schools, there is this huge gap between uh, policy and practice and uh, hearts and minds and beliefs. Uh, and unfortunately, we are trying to legislate and litigate um, people's beliefs around gender and sexuality. And that's what gets really tricky, uh, particularly at the school level. Um, I think back to 2016 when Obama, then President Obama, uh, my president, um, put a dear colleague letter out and said, you know, this is what we mean when we say gender and sex in Title IX. Uh, and then in 2017, uh, the reality star formerly known as the president uh, rescinded that guidance and said, this is not what we're going to do. And instead of the federal government governing uh, our approach to transgender students, we're gonna leave that to the districts. We're gonna leave that to local um, education administrations. And, and while I was frustrated about that, um, it really, it, it sparked this conversation about how local leaders, it's incumbent upon them to make the decisions for their communities. Um, I do believe that the federal government should uh, mandate and make it very clear about uh, what schools should do when it comes to trans students. But in Maryland, it enabled us to not look at the federal government and look to our local leaders and say, what exactly are you gonna do? 
uh, for queer and trans students. Um, if anyone knows anything about Maryland, we have a Frederick County, which is actually the largest county by landmass, um, and kind of a conservative county. They were the first county to pass a gender inclusive policy in Maryland, uh, policy 443. And so they took that first stab at saying that if you are a trans student in schools, uh, you have the right to be called the name that you want to be called and the pronoun that you want to be uh, referred to by. And you have the right to uh, participate on athletics and school teams and gender-based uh, facilities. Um, and I think that while that policy was a huge win, what we didn't spend enough time on was that, that, that sense of self, that core belief. Like, why are these things important? What are the conditions and the beliefs that enabled us to believe or disbelieve that trans students should have had these rights in the first place. Um, and so I think that what I really try hard to do uh, is close that gap between policy and belief so folks understand why is it that we have these policies. Um, after Frederick passed that policy, Baltimore was actually the second district um, and I was one of the large leaders of that effort. I've always had to balance a very delicate dance between working within systems and uh, quite frankly, against this thing. Uh, so I, you know, planned a protest on the on the lawn of the school, uh, the school building to say, you know, local leaders, what exactly will you do? Um, in a couple of years, we were able to pass policy JBB. Um, and so, you know, I point to these examples because we had these incredible policies in Maryland, from Frederick County to Baltimore, we're now seeing some in Anne Arundel County and Howard County, but there still isn't a real understanding about when it comes to the personal, uh, when I think back to that, that iceberg, uh, those beliefs that we have, uh, how do they enable us to effectively implement these policies? And that's still yet to be seen. Um, so we can't legislate and litigate people's hearts and minds. Um, so I think that while policy is one of the answers, it's not the only answer. We still have to have conversations about uh, where our cultural beliefs come from and how they impact how we treat students. Thank you, Jabari, and passing the mic to Dr. Alan Handy. Hi, everyone, again. Um, wow, what an amazing uh, group of, of colleagues here today. Um, so when I think about culturally affirming spaces in my particular work, so I recently went through the tenure process. And when you go through that, <laughs> that process, that I survived, um, and I do say survived because it it is it is a trip. Um, but what I will say is that you really get to see the the power um, structures that are in place in ways that you wouldn't, right? And so one of the things I've really committed my work to is kind of using the master's tools to tear down the master's house, so to speak. So having been able to go through this process, understand what it looks like to gain tenure at um, an institution of higher education. It is my job to now bring those behind me. And one of the things that I've really focused on is um, what Roland talked about earlier about uh, youth participatory action research and community-led action research. So the majority of my research is really focused on not even empowering folks because people are already empowered, but it's using the tools, right? That, that the academy likes to reserve for their own um, and, and doing work around building the capacity of marginalized communities to kind of work their way through their own oppression, giving them the language, the tools, the, the you know, ways of knowing and being that they already have and leveraging those um, through a process that you know, looks very much what, like what the, the institution tries to reserve for itself. And so demystifying or democratizing these methodologies um, you know, giving them access to, um, you know, things like publication to get their voices out there around issues that are important to them. Um, and so culturally affirming spaces, I also look at it as counter spaces, right? There are just some spaces that we have to create for our, ourselves, right? And that is not to say that others aren't welcome, but in order to really combat the microaggressive behavior that we might experience or students might experience in schools is to have these counter spaces where they are affirmed where I can be my full, true, authentic self. And so culturally affirming spaces are, you know, it, it's hard. It, it's a lot of negotiation that has to go back and forth, particularly when you're a part of the system, but also trying to dismantle the system from within. Thank you, Dr. Allen Handy. And I just want to lift up some of what we've heard across all of the responses is a focus on self-awareness. 
right? Of starting with oneself, of naming a challenge, using tools like a self-assessment to identify where the starting point is and to also build community so that we're all looking at the same thing. Um, we talked about uh, knowing who is in the room, right? All of the, the language uh, diversity in this space. And we think about that was a simple question and now we feel even more bonded because we know something different uh, about someone than how we initially started. Um, thinking about um, the, the hearts and minds and that this uh, phrase that you use, Jabari, of legislating beliefs, um, that I'm, I'm gonna sit with that. That's an invitation, thank you. Um, also thinking about the, what Dr. Allen Handy just shared, the tools and resources that we can put in the hands of our students, our families, our communities so that they can self-govern and that they can create uh, the realities that allow them um, to flourish and, and be and live their best lives. Uh, thank you all for those shares. So our next couple of questions are, um, one is uh, how do we work to reduce and transform systemic harm in schooling and school systems? And then kind of piggybacking, like how do we avoid furthering a culture of compliance, right? So what we're um, situating is that, you know, a culture of compliance is often what perpetuates some of the systemic harm or contributes. And so, in your work, in your experience, you know, what have you seen um, in terms of the reducing and transforming um, that harm to more uh, validating and supportive and caring, nurturing environments for our uh, racially, culturally, and linguistically and gender diverse students? Um, and we're gonna start with Jabari uh, for that question. Yeah, I think, you know, in the beginning, I, I wanna zoom in on this culture of compliance because for a while, it was commonplace. It was okay to deny LGBTQ students their, their basic abilities to be themselves at school, whether that be uh, uniforms or athletics or uh, restrooms or bathrooms. Um, and, and a lot of that is back to this whole notion of starting with ourselves. Like, let's be real about what were the things we were taught about lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people? Um, how did those, those beliefs enable us to think uh, things about our students, um, how LGBTQ identity is seen largely as a cultural failure um, or a taboo or a moral failure, uh, when really it's, it's commonplace and it's something that uh, communities, particularly communities of color, have celebrated throughout the entire existence and, and really interrogating how uh, uh, colonization and racism have really played into how we talk about gender and sexual diversity. Um, and so I think we have to get real about how we got here, um, how some of the, um, the hesitation or the disbelief that we have about people and their own agency to self-define who they are, um, I think is huge. There's a lot of healing, a lot of cultural healing that we have to do uh, for how we got to this place. But I think oftentimes schools are looking for the right answer for, you know, to prevent uh, if something is ever going to happen. And I think that that might not be a smart goal. Really, there needs to be a strategy for when. And so installing strategies and systems of justice is huge. Uh, restorative practices for us to sit down and talk about how harm was caused. Maybe you didn't believe that this was harmful, but let me talk about how it was. Um, you know, microaggressions, which I take umbrage a little bit with that word, because I think it minimizes the aggression that so many communities of color and and marginalized community space. Um, but I think that, you know, we can't have these in, include, uh, strategies for inclusion without having strategies for justice. So like not really if something is gonna happen, but when and how do we heal? Um, so again, you know, I'm, I'm hearing this through line about starting with ourself and our personal beliefs as the base for some of this stuff, but also thinking about when we get things wrong, when we misstep, when we have spots that we didn't see. Um, how do we how do we harm uh, and how do we heal from that harm? Thank you, Jabari. And Dr. Allen Handy. Sure. Um, I think this is a wonderful question, um, particularly because the way that we reduce harm is is remove those who are causing harm. So in the space that I'm in, in a school of education, these are the teacher educators, right? The folks that are preparing teachers, and yet they are deficient in a lot of the cultural competency justice orientations that we're talking about today. 
So in order to shift, to reduce harm, we, we need to totally restructure teacher education. Um, how can we actually map culturally affirming practices as non-negotiable, right? I sit in faculty meetings with, you know, full professors, distinguished professors who say, I don't do social justice as if it's a choice in education, as if it is, you know, oh, something that Ayana and those folks, you know, the radical folks do over there. Um, and so I think in order to reduce, you know, the harm, it's, it's removal, right? But especially in a system like our higher education systems where you have these structures of lifelong appointments, right? People don't actually have to change. People's, you know, I love what Jabari was saying about the alignment or disalignment between beliefs, practices, dispositions, and policies, right? Those poli policies that are so ingrained into the structure that cannot be shaken up, then those practices and beliefs can be perpetuated, right? And, and the way that, you know, we reduce that harm is how do we, you know, shake up a system like that? Those are, you know, questions that I'm constantly thinking about and pondering. But I do think a critical place, you know, for this in my world is, is really the structure of teacher education and the teacher educators themselves. Thank you, Dr. Allen Handy. You do call um, to mind uh, the work of Dr. Maria del Carmen Salazar, who does work of teacher evaluation as a cultural practice. And what she's introducing are how do we um, solidify or um, have indicators of cultural competence, of, of culturally responsiveness in our teacher evaluation system. Some of the work that she did um, looking for equity and in, in the word culture across, you know, some of our more famous frameworks that barely mention it, right? Very little mention. And so if we start looking at educator effectiveness through this lens, like how do we support, I mean, and also providing support so that we're not just evaluating something we're not um, developing developing ourselves. Um, I, I, I hear her voice um, when you when you talk when you spoke. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Perez, I say, yeah. Have to unmute myself. Um, I love what Dr. Yana said and what you just um, added to. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, when I think about how we can reduce uh, harm and avoid um, this culture of compliance is is by naming it, by calling it out. Some people are still refusing to acknowledge that that we have uh, an issue. Um, and on another note, I, I think about can we truly educate without equity and without social justice? I don't believe so. I they cannot be separate. It, it's not education, in my opinion, without those pieces. Because when we avoid um, the conversations and 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 the work behind it, then we're essentially um, ignoring a, a great number of of our students and and our staff in our communities. Um, it's as if we don't exist. Um, another important piece is. Uh, when we're silent, uh, silence is oppression. Uh, silence is uh, oppressive, and it, it may seem passive, but but trust me, it is oppressive. Um, and, and when we're silent, that way we're we're surrendering, surrendering, surrendering to racism, to the forces of whatever it may be that are harming many of our students in, in our communities. Um, Another piece that I think is really important in um, reducing and tr transforming um, this harm is um, really uh, being proactive. And the murder of George Floyd was in the faces of everyone, whether you wanted to, to admit that racism occurs and impacts uh, people. Um, and the pandemic was a reality check for, for many educators who, uh, you know, thought, you know, there's oppression and racism, but it's not really happening here. It, it really gave us a different perspective about what, what our students and, and communities experience and where we as a system have failed to provide resources and tools and supports to many of our students. So I say you start by talking about it and acknowledging that it exists 
And when you don't do that, you're, you're part of that problem, that oppressive system um, that continues to um, hurt our students and prevents us from creating culturally affirming spaces. Thank you, Dr. Perez, Isaiah, and Reed, you can close us out on this question. <laughs> Shut it down. Um, no, I really appreciate those, those, those connections. And, and, and the one piece I would add from, from our vantage point in, in terms of the work we do around root cause analysis. So we've, we've been tasked, particularly um, in, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, where s systems have now said, oh, racism is a thing that, that we now have to think about. And districts then said, maybe I can use this pot of money to engage this work. We've had a lot of calls for this idea of an equity audit, right? Um, and we, we, we enter that space trying to say, okay, we need a co-creative group of multi, you know, diverse stakeholding individuals, right? From community to, to teachers, to district leaders. And then we go through, uh, we go through policies, right? And, and, and what continues to, to just be such a reckoning is looking at code of conduct, looking at disciplinary policies and procedures and, and, and quite literally seeing codified control, right? Like we're, we're, we're in, 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 in paper, we are seeing that this is how we're engaging um, our students and in disproportionate numbers, we're seeing this is how you're engaging your, your black and brown students predominantly, right? Where, where we're continuing to see those dis disparate outcomes. So, I, you know, I just, I really appreciate uh, Jabari's push to this idea of uh, transformative justice, restorative practice and, what does it look like to, to engage culture as a way of being both proactively and reactively? What does it look like to, to, to redefine and rewrite the policy, but then the training that to, to, to our other colleagues point just doesn't exist, right? You look at accreditation, what you need to be, jump in the classroom, and then you layer that with 87% of our teachers are white, then you layer that with power and privilege and identity impact. And, and, and that, that harm is, is, is there, right? So I think how we move into relationship building based on identity self-reflection at core, restorative justice that's not whitewashed, but is culturally responsive and, and gives credit to, to the indigenous roots. All of those pieces I think are where we wanna go. But when we, when we do that work of, of looking at the codes of conduct, the disciplinary process, um, it's still on paper in so many districts. So um, just, just seeing that and, and the ways in which we can we try to push from there. Thank you, Reed. And adding to your um, response that we see on paper and then we see in practice, right, with our with teachers and the referrals and, and the different ways that they impose that um, codify control. I like that phrase as well. Thank you. Um, so I think David is going to, he's having technical issues, but he's going to try to pop in here and ask and pose a question for you all. Let's start with, can you hear me? <laughs> I'm happy to be back with y'all. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. Um, but I've just been blown away, but I, I'm hoping that I want to come back a little bit to a few things that the, your the panelists have offered around the culture of compliance, right? Dr. Uh, Perez, Isaiah, you brought that back up. Jabari, you talked a little bit about uh, when to be within the system and there's moments where we have to be outside of the system, right? And I think uh, Dr. Alan Handy, you talked about using the, the master's tools to dismantle the master's house, right? Um, and I, I want to talk about that. I, I was uh, for a different project interviewing a, a, another scholar. I'll, I'll keep him confidential, a black scholar. Um, he pushed it in that interview to say that often our educators, uh, the, the higher they move up in our system, often uh, the more uh, compliant they have to be with the system to very practically to get the promotion, right? Like we don't necessarily promote radicals. Now I'm not saying we there's uh, as a system, right? Um, and so I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to how um, 
what that means, right? How do we navigate that challenge as educators as we hope to gain positional power to, to, to dismantle the, the house, right? Um, so how do we navigate that? And then I'm also hoping uh, we can talk about, I, I wanna contextualize that based on our social identities, right? I know as a, as a uh, in my identity, that's different. Like Erin and I will often talk about, I can say the same thing in a training and be very differently received than Erin is, even though we scripted the exact same sentence, right? And so I'm hoping as we talk about uh, how we navigate that as we move through the system, uh, if we can also talk about how our social identities impact that as well, if we're comfortable. And maybe, I don't know, I don't wanna shoot, I know I haven't heard from doc, Dr. Ayanna Cooper, if you wanna start, if not, you know, feel free to, to jump in if you have, if you wanna start us off. Sure, sure, no, no, thank you so much. Um, gosh, I just wanna connect back to so much, but I'm watching the clock. Okay, a couple of things. Read, I wanna connect back um, to something you said in Jabari, and oh my gosh, Ayanna, everybody in Rosa too. Okay, so. First of all, for what this looks like with the schools and partners that I work with is number one, we have to embrace being uncomfortable. You've got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? So imagine having on a pair of shoes that you just bought. They look great with the outfit, but they hurt your feet. You got to keep them on. You got to keep the shoes on because this work is not all about everybody feeling happy and is it a you know cupcake or a butterfly no like this work gets messy so how do we embrace the messiness and that that means that we're making progress and one of the things i wanted to really kind of hone in a, in on is this idea of being data driven versus being data informed i just had a conversation yesterday with a school and they were talking about all the things they were doing for their multilingual population but there were data sets that they weren't using so now they're being selected. We're going to use this data because, you know what, we can work with it. It makes us more comfortable. Well, that's not helping you really make the best decisions. And how can you become data informed? So again, Reed, I just want to give you some statistics about uh, English learner populations from the United States Department of Ed. Right now, about 15% of English learners are chronically absent. About 14% of English learners have been retained. And about 13% of English learners have experienced out of school suspension. So you take these numbers and then you have language or access to content as a barrier and there you go, right? So I'm not comfortable with these numbers, all right? So this to me is my iceberg. So these are the numbers that we know about and that got reported, but imagine all of the numbers that we don't know about. So clearly I believe that this is much lower than what's actually you know, happening, okay? So how are we being, um, informed and what data points are we using? Because I'll give us diversity, right? We're, we're diverse because I'm a Virgo and you're a Sagittarius and you're a Pescatarian and I'm a carnivore. I'll give us diversity, but we are not equitable and we are definitely not inclusive, okay? So the, again, how do we embrace being uncomfortable with the work? The other um, part I wanted to connect to is really looking at that positionality, right? And Jabari talked about this. How am I as a non-district employee, right? Able to kind of move things along a little further than if I was a district employee. And also, you know, how do we embrace that and say, here's where I can get more traction by being this outsider who works alongside versus being someone who is in a district and I have to think about all of that promotion and, and all of those things that, that district leaders think about or what their career trajectories are. I knew early on in my career that this is the work that I was built to do, if you will. So I had to embrace lots and lots of uncomfortable um, situations and microaggressions and door slamming, I mean, you name it, but it never stopped me from continuing to seek a community of practitioners who wanted to do the work alongside me. So although we're in these boxes today, in my mind, I feel like I'm locking arms with all of you right now. So thank you. Thank you for, for that, uh, Dr. Cooper. And I'll also jump in also in response to, to David's question. Um, I really latched on to this whole notion of 
uh, getting the promotion, right? And I think that the, the villain that we have to kind of talk about as people advancing social justice is capitalism, right? Um, quite frankly, there is no, and we've heard this before, there's no ethical consumption under capitalism anyway, right? But I could do a whole panel on how I had to navigate being the first director of LGBTQ affairs within a system that um, were advancing policies so that my people wouldn't be there, right? So that the fact that I got to traipse around City Hall as a fat, Black, queer, gender non-conforming person uh, really did matter. And it played a role into what conversations I was able to have, how much proximity to power I was able to have. Um, but at the end of the day, I have to eat, right? I have rent to pay. I have uh, you know, food and, and family to support. And so I think that constantly negotiating how we push on systems uh, carefully so they don't trample us, so that we have to eat at the end of the day, but still remain true to our values. And I think that's a delicate dance. Um, and I think that often we don't really understand the, the very complex and difficult position that we put a lot of our internal and external advocates in when they are advancing systems, when they are advancing change, uh, but also at the end of the day are advancing their own careers and in their own uh, pockets as well. So I don't have an answer for that. I think that I'm constantly interrogating how uh, capitalist culture shows up and how we proliferate a lot of this stuff. Um, but you know, working within a system as someone that the system is actively working against, um, woo, still healing. I have to say something about that, Jabari. I love everything that you just said. Um, I want to say part, and I, I am personally in that position, right? Always as as director in a school district. Um, so the real, okay, number one, align yourself and find some co-conspirators in this work. That's, that's super important because it, it just, it's empowering to be around um, like-minded individuals who, who want changes for, for students. And the re reality um, of, of, cap uh, of a capitalist culture, at the end of the day, when we create culturally affirming spaces for students and staff, when we are equitable in our work as educators and ed leaders, um, students succeed, all students achieve. And if we're looking for success, I mean, that's the payoff, right? So if, if you, I am doing it for, for success for individual students because I had those opportunities and that is why I am here today. But if you wanna look at it from a different lens, from that capitalist lens is, the goal is student achievement and that pays uh, in many different ways. So when you're doing this work and you're getting results, which you will, when done right, you will. I, I've seen it, I've been there. You can't argue with that and boards want success, parents want success. Of course, students want success. Teachers want success. With that success comes recognition. And it, it, it's balancing that. It is the way you're delivering information. It is the way you are bringing people along and creating um, an alliance and a partnership and, and that co-conspirator um, with, with uh, those doing the work with you, but ultimately the achievement speaks volumes and, and looking at data and that achievement is really part of that, that, um, that equity review and, and those check-ins, um, that's all. Wow, um, I'm still like, really, really taking it all in right now. I'm having a, a, a physical reaction to this conversation. Um, Jabari, what you said about no ethical consumption of capitalism, right? Right. When you're in systems that are purely, purely run on capitalism, capitalism, particularly, you know, being at a private um, institution. Um, and I think going back to, to David's question around promotion and, you know, how do you navigate the system? I think about, you know, that saying of like, never forget where you come from, right? So my roots, like the antecedents 
of who I am and what I'm doing now was being a classroom teacher. Those are the most transformative years of my life. Those seven years being in the classroom, working with students. And so that is who I bring into all these other spaces, right? Is me, Miss Allen, you know, with my first grade kiddos who, you know, changed my life in ways that I can't even express. I think when you're kind of going up this kind of promotional, you know, ladder of, for me specifically, the academy, it's giving the academy what it wants by doing what I want to do, right? So for instance, the academy loves, it thrives off of publications, external funding, you know, incredible service and, you know, amazing teaching. It thrives off of all of these things. So I said, okay, I'm going to give y'all what you want. I'm going to get external funding for projects that center community, right? That are community led and youth led. Okay, I'm going to write and publish, but not only am I going to write and publish, it's going to be co-authored with the folks doing the actual work. So in my situation, it's how do you leverage the, the resources of the system and put them in the hands of, the, of others to be able to shift the, the perspective of the capitalism, right? So it's getting the funding, the, the part of capitalism, but now I'm gonna hire community folks to be full-time employees of the university. So now they have access to everything that I have access to, and I'm not going to say, oh, I'm just researching and working for these folks. Uh, no, they work for us. They are employees, right? So it, I think when I think about the promotion, like there's no way, right, that I could be here by myself. We have to lift, you know, as we climb. And I'm still, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. And now it is my, you know, turn to do so. I'm like amazed that one of my students is, is in the room. I'm like, what are you even doing here? She, she, you know, sent me a message that she was here. And I'm like, you know, you just never know who's in the spaces that 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 we're in. So I just thank you all for this discussion once again. Awesome. And Reed, I'm just circling up with you, but I'm taking your pause as yes, thank you. Um, all right, so we are very close to time. Um, Again, we have a lot of, of more exciting questions. We definitely need like a part three, four or five, all of the parts, um, but would like to invite closing thoughts from each of you. Um, and that can be whatever's on your heart and mind. It could be a non-negotiable as you engage in this work, um, but closing thoughts that you'd like to impart um, with our audience. And the floor is open. And once you're finished, you can pass the mic um, to someone else. Well, since I'm so soft-spoken. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Ayana, would you like to go? Sure, are you okay with that? Yes, yes. Okay, sure. okay, thank you. Dr. Ayana has me scrolling the list. Now I'm looking for my students, okay? I'm just checking the list, checking it twice. So <laughs> got class in a couple of hours. So I was just, let me check and see who's here. Um, so I, thank you so much for um, inviting me to be a part of this conversation. It is, it's never enough time. So, uh, so I have to embrace, you know, getting uncomfortable with there's so much more to be said and so much more to hear. Um, for me, this work is a civil rights issue. And I ask eight simple questions. Most educators can only answer three to four of the eight. I call them eight simple questions, but with complex answers. And so when we're thinking about our linguistically diverse populations, yes, let's serve as advocates for them, but let's also show them how to advocate for themselves, right? You also don't have to identify personally with that population to be an advocate or an ally, right? So I get the question a lot, oh, why do you do this work? Are you an English learner? And I'll say, no, but I'm sure my ancestors were. Right. I also acknowledge that teachers don't wake up every day, right, with the intent on violating someone's civil rights. Nobody wakes up and says, I get two before lunch. Let me get that on my to do list. Nobody does that. So I just want to kind of put that out there. However, it happens all the time because of past practice. We've always done it this way. Somebody said, This is how we do it. Right. And so instead of us just kind of going along with the status quo, let's, you know, find a community that can help build our sense of efficacy and get more courageous. Right. Like like those agitators, you know, they're putting the agitators back in the washing machines because the clothes weren't getting washed. Mm -hmm. 
So how can we make good trouble? Yes, and be good agitators. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Perez, I say yeah. Thank you, that, that was beautiful. Um, Dr. Ayana, I have your, your work on my list. Um, I just wanna say that um, creating uh, culturally affirming spaces, uh, being a leader um, who, who does the work with uh, equity and social justice, um, it's our collective responsibility. It's really our moral imperative. If, if we don't educate and lead in this way, then we are essentially leaving so many of our students behind and saying you're not worth the time and space and work um, to include you, um, to educate you fully, to address your whole needs. If it's not you, then who? This is our res responsibility. It is our shared responsibility. Thanks. I can jump in uh, with some closing thoughts. I guess I would say, first, um, you know, as a queer person um, and as queer people, we are always told that we don't know ourselves, right? And so believe us, believe your students. Um, believe them. <laughs> um, I think so many times, you know, because we were going to talk about authentic student engagement, I'm really sick of doing work for students that isn't done with students. Um, and so the phrase youth advisory board is a triggering phrase for me, because they are often not done well. You can't have a group of students and feed them pizza and ask them what they want and think and then go into another room where where it happens and then pick apart what you think might be appropriate for them. Um, all LGBT kids have been asking forever has been to be believed and to be trusted about the supports that they need. So when it comes to their name, their pronouns, uh, building strong relationships with their families, I think that that's another narrative we have to shift uh, is that we don't want to accept as the status quo that young people can't have strong and nurturing relationships with their parents and caregivers we want to, to do that when it's possible, but when it's not possible, then what do we do? So believe those students. Um, and then of course, something I've said before is really think about the earliest messages. You know, Think back to when you were a young person, what did your parents say? What did the media say? Your religious leaders, your teachers, what did they teach you about being queer? Um, what do they teach you about lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people? Um, and then and really examine how those beliefs, um, they show up in your work. Um, so much of this is about um, the, the education that we did not have. You know, we, inclusive sex ed, I could do a whole talk just on inclusive sex ed, but we are so starved for knowledge about ourselves, um, starved for knowledge about gender and sexuality that uh, it creates harm. And so LGBTQ people, believe us. I, I would just kind of um, add and center for my own positionality as, as, as a, a, a cis white man carrying a lot of power and privilege in these spaces to like, what does active allyship look like? What does it, what, what does it mean to step in and step back? I know that's ironic because I'm on this platform uh, right now. And what does it mean to share voice and to know how do I, how do I support as a co-conspirator so the folks on here that, that hold these identities of power and privilege, what is everyday work? Because ultimately we are making choices every day that either uphold the system or help to break it down. Um, and for me, if I don't question that, every time I step into a space that's about equity, if I don't question why I'm even there, um, I'm not doing my own personal work. So I'll just leave us with that and, and, and say thank you to, to, to my colleagues on this. Um, wow. Um, so my, my kind of closing takeaways um, for you all is that no matter your positionality, no matter your position, you know, your role, think about what is in your locus of control, right? What are, there are so many things that are out of our control in the systems that we work within. 
but what is actually in your locus of control. So as a teacher, a classroom teacher, that one word of affirmation, you know, to, to a little black girl like me, I love your natural hair, right? What does that do to the child's sense of self, right? And then think about, you know, if you are a principal, right? And you have this deep responsibility to all of the teachers and all of the staff and all of the people, you're the shepherd, you know, of your school, how are you not only personally doing the work, right? Kind of the self excavation. So Yolanda Celia Ruiz really talks about this excavation of the self, right? Like that's where the real work starts, right? And I think that gets to a lot of what Jabari was saying about my personal beliefs and how do they align and, and disalign with the systems that I'm working within. Um, so for me, what I constantly try to think about is what is in my locus of control? I am sitting in this seat, I'm at this table, you know, what can I do within that? And if even if I'm not at the table, I matter, right? What I'm doing matters. And so that would be kind of my closing um, remarks. Wow. <laughs> Thank you all. I think we're all sitting with a lot of new learnings and understandings and connections. Um, and so I just want to hold space for, for all of that. I want to express our gratitude and appreciation on behalf of the Rail West, my team here, um, for you all just coming and delivering. We already got a comment of when is part three. I said, we'll keep you posted. <laughs> um, and the work continues. And thank you for helping us being a, a guide or, you know, lamppost um, on our journeys. We appreciate it greatly.